Was that Aokiji? You know, it sure does seem that way, and I think it's quite difficult to draw any other conclusion from this cover. And if so, if so, I am so damn hyped to see this man again. To get something out of the way, I've seen a lot of suggestion that this could be Caesar's gas weapon from Punk Hazard. The one that, for want of a better word, thoroughly pompeyed everyone that it came into contact with. I highly doubt it's Caesar's gas though, because it left its victims in a more blob-like state. There was almost no detail left on the faces, whereas Kuzan's ice always leaves that nice, mmm, crisp detail. Don't know why I went, mmm, there. But in addition to that, Caesar isn't even in Chocolate Town right now. So unless it's a wild card Vince Smoke judge pulling some sort of judge-based crap, I am like 99% certain that this is Kuzan. Or a very well-designed red hair. However, taking all of that into account, the question then becomes, why is Kuzan in Chocolate Town specifically? If he's in Toddland, then he's likely acting on behalf or even with the Blackbeard Pirates. Because yeah, Teach, Devon, and Vasco Shot went to Amazon Lily, but that still leaves a whole ton of the crew free to frolic about. I would have thought that he would show up at Whole Cake Island directly to take the road Poneglyph. But then again, Chocolate Town does have another very important asset. Charlotte Pudding is currently in Chocolate Town because we saw her punching Niji and Yonji when they were placed on display there. And I guess here's the thing. You can steal Big Mom's Poneglyphs, no problem really. Whole Cake Island's super, super weak right now. But what good are the mystery cubes without someone to read them? Unless Blackbeard has something else up his sleeve, which I imagine would be difficult to fit due to his thick with two C's sausage arms, then awakening the pudding power seems like a very viable path to make him a true competitor for Pirate King. Not only that, but this is the perfect time to strike with the perfect person. News of Big Mom's defeat is no doubt spreading like a nasty rash throughout the world. A huge chunk of the Big Mom pirates aren't even in Totaland to defend it, and basically all that stands between this empire's prosperity and its collapse is a singular donut enthusiast. And to beat Katakuri, you're going to need someone who isn't the regular old Blackbeard pirate scrub. Like Jesus Burgess, for example, that dude. That man needs a collar with Sabo's name on it because that's how much he got owned. However, sending in an admiral level combatant is a sure thing. Katakuri, yes, he is quite powersome, but Kuzan is on a whole different tier of this cake, a very specific flavor known as mochi infused with humiliation. There is a silver lining to this though, because if Katakuri was to fight and was to lose, he probably wouldn't fall on his back. He'd just be frozen upright, so at least he gets to, well, to somewhat maintain his reputation. But first, I'm wearing a jacket now, but also a question. Have you ever wanted to dress your dog up like some sort of man? Michael Flamingo and turn him into a Scottish Lord, because I have, as did the sponsor of this video, Established Titles, a project based on a historic Scottish custom whereby landowners are referred to as lairds, lords, or ladies in English. And you can officially change your name to lord or lady on stuff like credit cards, it's amazing. And I use this power to have Don Quixote Dog Flamingo officially declared as a lord. It's all right here on this shockingly official proclamation. Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland. It's a great last minute gift for loved ones or even just semi-liked ones. Also, I've been told that everyone who uses my link will get a plot next to each other, so we could even build our own like little Scottish Grand Line Empire. It's also a fun novel way to preserve the nature of Scotland because Established Titles plants a tree with every order and works with global charities on restoration efforts. Go to establishedtitles.com to shop their early Black Friday sale with an additional 10% off using code GRANDLINE and help support the channel starting from the 10th of October. But now it's back to you. Me? The idea of gloves slash weapons that can touch light has made me think of a bizarre matchup between Frankie versus Kizaru. Something that I've never considered, but now absolutely need. This is why I love talking to you guys, because somehow this completely flew over the rusty cogs that make up my brain thing. Vegapunk's invention here is effectively a hard counter to Kizaru. Being able to interact with light is like giving any wearer of these gloves instant armament haki. Except better, because Kizaru may not necessarily be able to counter it with haki of his own. Because this isn't about about willpower, it's about fictional science gloves. I think it makes a lot of sense that something like this was invented because Vegapunk has actually used Kizaru as a research subject, finding methods to adopt his laser beams and then insert them into the Pacifista and now the Seraphim. And I suppose these gloves could now be used to counter the Pacifista and the Seraphim as well. I mean, I say counter, like the laser beams were always able to interact with you by like obliterating your insides, so mm -hmm. And I feel like the obvious desire to take from this is to develop a whole range of anti-Kizaru apparel 
apparel, like a pair of shoes for Sanji perhaps. More so than that though, it really opens my eyes to how ridiculously powerful Vegapunk is. Oda has set this man, men, people up as someone who can make anything happen through science. The only restriction is time and money. In theory, Vegapunk could potentially develop or even have already developed counters to all of the other admirals. Like why not have some sort of anti-gravity device to counter Fujitora for example? And when it comes to the others, it's probably much easier from Vegapunk's perspective. You know, maybe make something like really cold to deal with Sakazuki and then maybe create a, a, like a super trowel or something to dig up Greenville's pretty little plants. Bonnie's chemistry with the crew was amazing. She almost felt like a straw hat the way she participated in gags. She really did. I mean, I don't want to start or hop on this train or even like lay down any of the tracks, but she really did. Bonnie fits in perfectly with the crew or at least this half of the crew. Along with Luffy and Chopper, you could even start calling them the hungry trio or something. And I think she'd have a great dynamic with most of the other crew members as well. At the very least, Brooke and Sanji for obvious you know, casual nudity and panty based reasons. What I'm starting to get more and more keen for is the moment where Bonnie discovers that her father's last desire as a human was to help the Straw Hats, to beg Vegapunk to program him to defend the Thousand Sunny for two whole years on Sabidi. Oh, and you know what's also kind of sad? I'm now not so sure if we've ever actually met Bartholomew Kuma. The whole time we've known him, he's been a cyborg. So who knows how much of that was the original him and how much of the original personality and core being had already been removed through Vegapunk's modifications. We could end up in a Kuma or Bonnie flashback and encounter a completely different character. Someone loud and emotional who over time gets those bits and pieces taken away from him to become the shell that he is today. Mate, I am just so damn curious and hyped for that flashback. Bonnie being the princess of the Sorbet Kingdom makes so much sense now. Guess we understand why Sakazuki was so afraid of her. I don't think we do understand, or at least I don't understand. I mean, Sakazuki shat his pants when he found out that Bonnie had escaped. So what's so important about her? In retrospect, I guess it seems likely that the world government may have been holding her hostage to ensure Kuma's cooperation. But then again, by the time that Sakazuki encountered Bonnie, Kuma had already been fully cyborganized. And oh wow, oh wow, I just had a thought and that thought is really sad. Bonnie and Kuma were both on Sabadi. And that was pretty much the last time that Kuma retained any shred of humanity. Humanity. So I'm wondering, did he get to speak to Bonnie one last time while they were both on the same island? And if so, maybe that's why she was crying in chapter 565. This was when the supernovas were watching the Paramount War broadcast, and it was previously thought that Bonnie was crying because she had some kind of connection to Whitebeard or Ace. But I think it's very likely that Bonnie was still dealing with the grief of having just lost her father and seeing him on screen, or actually more accurately, seeing his shell on screen. The Bonnie threads are finally starting to come together. I thought the Mari it was said the Bonnie was Kuma wife. Now it's her dad, maybe I'm wrong, but that's what I remember. All right, I think we know enough to dissect the situation as well. Bonnie used her aging ability to impersonate the Sorbet Kingdom's queen dowager Connie. Dowager being a particularly important word there because it specifically indicates a widow. So queen dowager Connie could have been Kuma's wife and thus the mother of Bonnie, with the dowager title being given due to the apparent no more existentness of Kuma. At the same time though, Connie did appear to be very, like very, very old. And unless Kuma was into women pretty much twice his age, I would say right now it's more likely that Connie was the grandmother of Bonnie and had to take on the title of queen because Kuma abdicated the throne and something terrible and tragic probably happened to Bonnie's mother because mothers in One Piece all have a fairly streamlined fate straight into an early grave. I will say now that the whole Princess Bonnie thing is a bit of a shock in general, especially when looking back on the picture that we have of her as a child, which would seem to indicate that she grew up quite poor because yeah, look, there's a lot of food but she's really dirty wearing scrappy clothes and all around displaying the classic Oda indicators of a less than affluent beginning. That's why Bonnie has always been fascinating though because all of these threads around her are inherently contradictory in some way. We're learning a lot, but we still don't know who Smoker will lose to. Ah, I disagree. If Smoker does appear in this arc, then I think we've learned that he could lose to Luchi, Kaku, Stucia, Seraph or any of the six Vegapunks. There is a whole loser buffet of options for Smoker to choose from. However, we still have no confirmation where the Smoker is a member of S.W.O.R.D. at all. Same for Tashigi, who seems to have been kept out of the loop when it comes to S.W.O.R.D., which I'm sure will only give her massive FOMO because she is obsessed with anything S.W.O.R.D. related. I think Zoro either wants more hands so he can hold more swords or a compass fitted in his head that can always tell him the right direction. <laughs> I mean, just on that, the idea of a S.W.O.R.D.-based reason isn't absurd. Oda did reveal what devil fruits the Straw Hats would eat and apparently Zoro would want Kaido's devil fruit, except that he himself wouldn't eat it. He would want one of his swords to have the 
fruit. Which resulted in this cursed image, I drew that one time, which allegedly former President Obama commented on, expressing his approval. However, the best idea I've seen for why Zoro wants to talk to Vegapunk actually takes us back to Wano. And it's the thought that Zoro is seeking a cure for the residents of Ibisu Town who were affected by the smile fruits, because Zoro developed quite a deep connection with them in particular. And Vegapunk is the obvious best person to talk to. Caesar made the smile fruits, but Vegapunk is the one who understands fruit-based science the bestest. And he was also the closest to constructing a fully functional artificial devil fruit. It was cool to see the six parts of Punk. I'm wondering if Vegapunk put parts of his soul or something into each one of them in order for them to operate. Oh, wow. wow. Okay, so this is where things could get very, very existential. I spoke before about wondering how much of Kuma we really knew or even if we ever knew an actual Kuma, but this discussion gets infinitely more complicated with Vegapunk. Especially because we know for a fictional fact that souls exist in One Piece. This has been proven on roughly a gazillion occasions through devil fruits like Brook and Big Moms, but also through random elements like seeing Lao Ji's soul leaving his body mid-battle. Souls not only exist, but Big Mom's devil fruit proved that they can be split into independent entities. Zeus and friends of Zeus were created using fragments of Big Mom's soul. And while they are at her command, they do retain an internal locus of control. They have their own personalities, their own desires, their own whole lives. And whilst I'm not sure if Vegapunk's science found a way to manipulate, much less split the soul, a similar thing could have happened by breaking his mind down to raw data and then fragmenting it across the six punks. And this is where things start to get very ghost in the shell, because if each of the punks have received a fragment copy of data, does that mean that they have souls? Are they truly alive or are they just incredibly advanced machine copy things? I'm really not used to grappling with these kinds of questions in One Piece, but I am very interested at the very least by how Vegapunk chose to split himself, specifically with the number designations one through six, because I wonder if that denotes his priorities as a person, which would initially make sense. That's why logic is punk one. That's the most valuable aspect of science, being able to look at things purely objectively. But then punk two is the concept of evil. So the second priority is, is then kind of terrifying. And all in all, it's really interesting to know that one sixth of Vegapunk can be summed up by evil. Is the OG Vegapunk dead? And now he's split into the six punks, or is he still alive and the six are like his helpers? It's still vague, but from what I understand, Vegapunk, Punk. Vegapunk did split himself into six. But I imagine that his original body may still exist somewhere in stasis, unless the reason why he split was because the body was about to die, in which case, you know, we don't really need that chunk of meat anymore. Vegapunk is going to enter the straw hat. All right, so I think you've made that comment sound much more sexual than it needed to be. But look, the Vegapunk for straw hat campaign has well and truly begun. Now that the world government have done the stupidest thing possible, it's pretty reasonable to see at least one of the Vegapunk Punk's coming aboard as a traveler, especially if Oda ever wanted to take the crew into space. There's also room for travel companions now because I think we're about to open up that door with Bonnie as well. Unless Egghead Island is a full length 50 chapter arc, I, I just don't see Bonnie's time with us ending here. In terms of actual straw hats though, eh, it may be too late. Luffy sharing his dream with everyone does very much solidify to me that this is the final incarnation of the core crew. And until proven otherwise, I'm going to stick to the philosophy of we're done when it comes to straw hats. Just like we're done with this video, but there's always another one waiting for you right around here, so, so go there.